Okay, I just started recording, so I'm gonna try to share this screen. And then I've got uh, one student helping me. So do you see the screen? Not yet. Let me know when you do. No screen. No screen. No screen. Let's start over. No, don't start over. I think it quit on me. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. Yay. Okay. All right, people. Uh, so this is going to just be an audio version. I'm going to just voice over my uh, lecture, and I'm going to go very fast. It's going to be like warp speed. But uh, you'll be able to, since it's audio, you should be able to go back and replay the parts if you get, um, if it gets too fast for you. So anyway, this nervous sec nervous system lecture one, and uh, I'll I'll try to blow through it in about thirty minutes. So anyway, here's the brain. Um, so make sure you know the lobes because sometimes we just put a piece of tape on the lobe. Like here would be the frontal lobe, that would be the temporal lobe, that would be the occipital lobe. And that would be the parietal lobe, just named right after the bones, just like the bones on the skull. This little structure right under here, cerebellum. Then this looks like a little belly, a little pregnant belly. That's the pons, P-O-N-S, don't spell it, P-O-N-D-S. It's pons, P-O-N-S. And here's the medulla oblongata. All right. Did that switch slides for you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so the functions of the nervous system, eh, it's just general knowledge here. Direct immediate response to stimuli coordinates activities of other systems. So the anatomical divisions, that's the physical anatomical divisions. You got the CNS, basically that's brain and spinal cord. And you have the PNS, that's peripheral nervous system. So that's everything else. So the CNS is central, the PNS is peripheral. So if you got receptors in the periphery, like out in your skin, you know, hot and cold receptors, touch receptors, whatever, that's um, part of your periphery. Uh, nerves, you know, like your sciatic nerve that we saw on the leg model, that's, uh, that's all in the periphery. Neuroglia, you guys don't know what those are yet, we'll go over those, they're separate little cells that support the uh, nervous system. You probably know one of them, like Schwann cells that myelinate, uh, axons in the periphery, but we'll get to it. Don't worry. All right, don't stress on this slide. This got a lot of information on it. We'll keep coming back to it over and over. And uh, neuro's kind of like this. At first, it's not going to make a lot of sense to you because it's just so much vocabulary coming at you. Uh, but as you get the terminology down, then it starts to click. So right at first, if you're confused, don't be upset. That's just the way it is. And then as you keep going through it and keep going through it, you go, oh, I'm starting to understand now. It's kind of like wiring in a house. This is going this way. This signal's going this way. So anyway, let's just look at some of these words. And you should be familiar with some of them. CNS, PNS, we just talked about. Afferent versus efferent. These are simply directional terms, OK? Um, so if you're in the central nervous system, say the spinal cord, and you're going out of the spinal cord down a nerve to have an effect, that's an efferent signal. That's a motor signal. It's exiting, which also starts with an E, and it has an effect. Afferent, say I scratch my hand, that's a sensation. That's a sensory signal. So that's going to travel up my arm through whatever nerve, and then it's going to go into my spinal cord and up to my brain. So that's uh, afferent. Now, in the CNS, now we're talking periphery. I should have been pointing over here, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I accidentally pointed at CNS. Um, so that, those two examples I just gave you were in the PNS. Now, if you're in the spinal cord or you're in the, say you're in the spinal cord, you scratched your arm, the signal went up the arm into the spinal cord. That's an apparent signal going to the spinal cord. Now you're in the spinal cord going to the brain. That's still afferent. So if you're going up the spinal cord, that's afferent. 
Whereas if I'm sending a motor signal, I want to clench my fist, then that signal is going from my brain down my spinal cord. So that's efferent when I'm going down the spinal cord. And then when you go out to the hand, down whatever, radial nerve or whatever, your median nerve, um, um, that's an efferent signal in the periphery. So it, I'm just trying to let you know that afferent and efferent are simply directional terms. If you're in the CNS, if you're in the spinal cord, going up it is afferent, going down it is efferent. Say you're in the brain, we do have cranial nerves. If you're leaving the brain, exiting the brain, that would be an efferent signal to say, you know, there's some muscles of facial expression. Now you scratch your face and it's go, that sensation is going in a cranial nerve to your brain, then that would be an afferent signal. Got it? All right, let's look at some more terms. Somatic versus visceral. I think of these almost as places or, yeah, places I guess would be the best way. So somatic, think, think basically muscles like skeletal muscle, skin and joints, you know, and mostly this is periphery. Um, visceral, think gut mainly. It's, it, it's a little hard to describe these terms, but um, smooth muscle, think smooth muscle and digestive organs for visceral. So um, somatic sensory would be signals coming from the muscles, skeletal muscle, skin or joints. Visceral sensory might be like, ooh, I shouldn't have eaten there, you know. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the gut, you know, sensory signals from the gut. Somatic motor. So remember, motor is going out to have an effect. So somatic motor, you're going out to the skeletal muscles. See skeletal muscles down here? Yeah. So that's voluntary. So skeletal muscles, they move your skeleton for the most part. That's why they're called skeletal muscles. Um, that's um, a voluntary signal for the, you know, um, where visceral motor, that's not under your control. That's mainly controlling smooth muscle, cardiac, and glands. So you can't go, I'm going to digest now, <laughs> right? It just happens automatically, right? You can't get, you know, when you get scared and your uh, hair stands up on your arms, uh, you can't go, I'm going to be scared now right? It's not under your control. So that's visceral motor. It's, you know, this whole division is also called the autonomic nervous system. So don't stress on this too much. I know that's a lot of info right at first, but we'll come back to it again and again and again. So SAMA is just a little mnemonic to help you. Sensory signals are afferent. Motor signals are efferent. Got it? All right. So that autonomic nervous system that we were just talking about, that's your sympathetic and your parasympathetic divisions. So on a multiple choice, not a multiple, yeah, I guess I could do, I guess I could do a multiple choice or a true false, um, or an essay. What are two functional divisions of the autonomic nervous system? All you got to say is sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sympathetic, you've heard about, I'm sure it's fight or flight. Parasympathetic, you may have heard this, they also call that, you know, rest and digest. And don't worry, we'll come back to this plenty. We're gonna skip over it for now though. Uh, so sympathetic, fight or flight, everything that happens when you get scared, basically. Parasympathetic, rest and digest. When you're just sitting there eating your hamburger, you know, telling a story around the campfire or whatever, then your parasympathetic is mostly in control. If you saw a bear in the woods earlier that day and you got scared, that was your sympathetic kicked in. Most of the time, your parasympathetic's in control. It's kind of like yin and yang, right? And, but most of the time, parasympathetic's in control. All right, don't stress on this too much. This is just terminology. I'm not, it's very rare. I'm going to ask you, what's the definition of gray matter? What's the definition of a nerve? Nah, you know, very rarely do I do terminology like that. Uh, this should just be part of your vocabulary when you're learning uh, neuro. So gray matter, I don't like the term nerve cell bodies. I say neurons, much more precise term. White matter, 
That's mostly myelinated axons. You should know what an axon is from your 130 classes or your 101 classes if you're Southwestern 130 classes if you're Quiamanica. So it's um, a nerve fiber is just a single axon. So you remember in our muscle uh, section, the entire skeletal muscle cell, they called it a fiber. Here, it's not the entire cell because the cell body is still just called the cell body, but the axon is called the fiber, okay? A bundle of fibers in the periphery would be a nerve. So like your big old sciatic nerve that we saw on the back of the leg uh, muscle model, that's um, a bundle of axons you know, it's lots and lots and lots of axons, you know, hundreds or thousands, I don't know how many, a lot, in, in a nerve. Some can be sending signals, you might be sending motor signals down some of the axons and some of the other, other I don't know if I'd even call them axons, but from, coming from the receptors would be sensory signals coming from the other direction. So some nerves carry sensory and motor, right? And we'll, don't worry about that, we'll get that to that later. Attract, so you can't call a bundle of axons in the brain or in the spinal cord. You cannot call them a nerve, but it's basically the same. It's a bundle of axons, right? So they call them tracks, T-R-A-C-T. Um, sometimes they call them columns. There's a weird Latin word. Sometimes they call them funiculi, uh, but I just mainly call them tracks, okay? A ganglion, you may not have heard this one yet, but it's a cluster of, I don't say nerve cell bodies, I say neurons, a cluster of neurons in the periphery. So a ganglion, you can have, so technically it's gray matter, right? Because it's, it's neurons, but you're not in the brain. You're not in the spinal cord. This could be, there are plenty of places you have ganglia, ganglia is plural, ganglion is singular. It's plenty of places you have ganglia all over the body, and we'll point out some special ones, but there's lots and lots of different ganglia. Uh, in a nucleus, this is not a nucleus like in a cell. This is just a generic word. So deep within the brain, brains are kind of weird. On the outside of the brain is where most of your gray matter is. It seems like, what's it doing way out there? but it's protected by the skull, right? But most of your neurons are in the cortex. Remember, cortex is just a generic word, um, means bark, like the bark of a tree. So it's on the outside, like bone had a cortex. Well, the brain has a cortex, and in the cortex, you have lots and lots of neurons. Now, deep inside the brain, it's mostly white matter. So that's mostly myelinated axons, but there are islands of gray matter scattered in there, and I'll show you some. We're not, not going to even have to learn them, but if I point at them, I go, what is that? You go, nucleus. You don't even have to tell me which one it is, right? You, but I could say, is it gray matter or is it white matter? And you just go gray matter. Easy points, easy points, all right? So cells of the nervous system, two types. You got neuroglia that we mentioned a little bit earlier, Take this number with a grain of salt, five to one. I've seen other texts say 10 to one. I've heard, seen other scientists say 50 to one. Who knows? It's more, <laughs> right? You have more neuroglia, which are supporting cells. You got different types. Then you have neurons. But you have lots of neurons, and I forget the exact number. Your book has it, so don't forget to read your book. Don't forget to read your textbook. It's like a text message. It's just really long. All right, <laughs> so um, here's a neuron. So I have that laminate, so that could show up on a test, and I could just point right here and go, what are these things? You should know those, those are dendrites. Is that where signals come into the cell? Yeah. Is this an axon going out? Yes. Um, so, don't, that sends a signal away from the cell. And these little ends are synaptic ends, synaptic boutons, synaptic bulbs, I don't care. 
what you call them. They got like six different names, but that's where your neurotransmitter leaves. And, you know, you're, it's basically transmitting to another neuron, or it could be a muscle, or it could be a gland, whatever. There's all kind of different effectors, they call them out there. So if this is on a, one of your uh, test pictures, I've only got a few things I can point at. A, dendrites. B, cell body. C, axon. D, synaptic bulbs or terminals, right? That's just point A. Don't miss the easy stuff. What about my student? Is she still with me? You still hear me? Are you there? Yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and, and you got my number. Just call me if it shuts off because sometimes I don't know when I'm on the PowerPoint if the signal dies. Right? Now, this is an axon hillock. So that's another little region I could point at. We're not going to stress on it too much because you'll get this in physiology. But that's like the little calculator. You have excitatory signals coming in and inhibitory signals coming into the cell, right? Um, if the excitatories went out, basically excitatory are little positive ions flowing across this membrane. We don't get hung up in that too much. But say you got a lot of sodium outside the cell and those have positive charges on them inside the cell membrane, it's a little more electronegative. Maybe if you put two probes across there, it'd be minus 70 millivolts. Don't stress on it, I'm not gonna ask you numbers. Um, so if you open sodium channels, which what excitatory signals would do, then sodium would flow in, which would depolarize that membrane. So instead of being minus 70, it might go to minus 60. You're getting less polarity. Now, if your axon hillock threshold is minus 50, if that cell membrane does not get to minus 50, it's not going to send a signal. But the, say it goes to minus 51, still not gonna send it. It's like on or off. If it hits, if this region here hits minus 50, if that's the threshold of that hillock, boom, more channels are gonna open in that hillock, more sodium is gonna flow in. It's going to really depolarize that area. And so it might go minus 30, minus 20, minus, it may go to zero. It, may, it can even shoot temporarily past zero into the positive territory. But don't stress on it. So that will totally depolarize the axon hillock, and that causes channels next to it to open. So those little channels will open. And now more positive ions flow in. So that little section will depolarize, which will affect the section next to it, which will depolarize. And it's kind of like a sequential thing, you know? It's, it's channels causing other channels to open all the way down. And it happens pretty quickly. And once you get down here and that gets, uh, these ends of it get depolarized, boom, that's when you send out the neurotransmitter. Now, behind that. So that's called an action potential, A-C-T-I-O-N, action potential. It's fast, but it's not crazy fast. The fastest one will travel down a myelinated axon is about 300 miles an hour, which is pretty fast, but it's not like the speed of light or electricity through a wire, you know, that's like unbelievably fast. This, and you know, sometimes I ask that on a multiple choice test, trying to, I mean, a true false you know, question, just trying to give away points. I go, true or false? An action potential is faster than electricity through a wire. And you'd be surprised how many people miss that question. It's not nearly as fast. It's, you know, 30 meters a second, something like that. We measure them all the time on the frog experiments out at San Diego State. And it's usually 10, 20, 30 meters a second. Speed of light is like 186,000 miles a second. So it's, you know, not even close. All right, so once that signal's sent, then you're gonna open other channels. Don't stress on this, except for you guys that are going on the physiology and potassium channels will open and potassium will flow out down its concentration gradient. And basically you're sending positives back out. Don't worry about whether it's sodium or potassium, just look at the charges. And now you're repolarizing those membranes. So that membrane's going back to minus 70 because you're sending positives out. Does 
So that's it in a nutshell, and that's going to help you a lot in physiology. I just wanted you to understand what an action potential is, because you need to know how are these signals being sent. Okay. All right. So dendrites. So this is everything we just said. The dendrites are stimulated. The axon helix like a little calculator. It sums it all up. And if you hit threshold, boom, there goes your signal. There goes your signal, you know, 300 miles an hour maybe, down to the synaptic terminals, boop, and there you put out your uh, neurotransmitter. You guys only know one neurotransmitter right now, that's acetylcholine. But there's plenty of more, there's plenty of more neurotransmitters, okay? So these are just point and name, don't miss the easy stuff, shapes of neurons. So this neuron here, when they looked at them under a microscope years and years ago, they didn't know what they were looking at. They go, oh, look, a pole, a pole, a pole, a pole, a pole. Hmm, we're going to call that a multipolar. Then they looked at this guy and see how the cell body's hanging off to the side, and it only looks like it's one pole. It's almost like a pole vaulter where the body is hanging off the side of the pole. And so that's called a unipolar. Your book now calls them pseudo unipolars. I don't care. You can call them a unipolar. Um, and we'll go back to what these do in a second. Here's a bipolar. See the way a pole is coming out of each end. It looks a little bit different, kind of similar to a unipolar, but so don't mix them up. Unipolar, the cell body's hanging off the side. A bipolar, the pole is emitting from each end or coming into each end, however you want to look at it. Um, and then this guy is an anaxonic. A or A-N in Latin in front of a word means without. So this means without an axon. What does this guy do all day long? This is the one chance you get on a test. If I ask you, you can answer, I don't know. And you get it right. <laughs> because I don't think anyone knows what these guys do. There's some theories, but all they have is dendr all they have are dendrites. There's no axons. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know, but they're only in the CNS. I could ask that. Where are they found? Only in the CNS. What do they do? I don't know. <laughs> go over here and you go, hmm, multipolar. I go, A, what shape neuron is that? You go, multipolar. You got a point. Then I go, what does it do? What's it do for a living? Motor. So motor neurons tend to look like this. So they're sending an efferent signal, right? To probably a muscle or gland or whatever. Point at this guy, you go unipolar or pseudo unipolar. What does he do for a living? You would go general sensory. They tend to look like this. So say this is out here in your skin and you scratched your skin and it's a sensation, you lightly scratched it. It's sending the signal this way, that say it's on your arm, and it's sending it to your spinal cord, right? So the, gain, the uh, cell body is not in your spinal cord. It's outside of the spinal cord in a ganglia, and we'll talk about that ganglia, those type ganglia later. But this little piece sends it on, say, into the spinal cord, if that's where we're at. And then it'll synapse with another neuron, and then that's going to send a signal to your brain. General sensory. Which lobe of the brain is that going to be processed in? Parietal lobe. And we'll, don't worry, we'll cover this much more later. When you see one of these, bipolar. What shape cell is that? Bipolar. Where is a good place to find them? You can put some special senses, but if you want to get more specific, you can say retina. There's even a layer in the retina called the bipolar layer. So that's a great place to find them. They're, they're real specific. They tend to be in some special senses. All right, so you're with me? So you go anaxonic, bipolar, unipolar, multipolar. And then I could ask you functions of each. And no one knows the function of that guy on the left. All right. Unless they figured it out in the last year and nobody told me. All right. So it's just showing that a neuron can talk to another neuron through neurotransmitters, or a neuron can talk to muscle, or it can say you're going to sweat, you know, it's going to talk to a gland or whatever. It's just showing that you have different signaling going on. And it's 
pretty much all chemical. They used to think it was like an electrical signal that could jump across, but then they discovered neurotransmitters and they think pretty much all of it is chemical now. They don't think there's any raw electrical signals, although I'm not 100% sure about that. There could be some voltage gated things going on, but don't stress on it. Usually you're using a neurotransmitter. All right, here's the neuroglia. So this could make a great uh, matching question or an essay question. I could go, name, this, name six neuroglia and tell me what they do. And you don't have to go all deep into it. This anatomy, this is not physiology. But let's start with the easy one, Schwann cells. So first of all, let's see how this is divided. Got yellow on one side, kind of purpley blue on the other side. This side is um, in the periphery. These two guys are in the periphery. These three, four types are in the central nervous system. So let's start over here. Schwann cells. Probably you heard of that already. High school, or you heard about it in bio one, whatever. Um, they myelinate in the periphery. So myelin, think of it like an insulation. It's kind of white. So when you see a nerve in real life, it, it looks white, right? Um, generally because of all the myelin. And it's just connective tissue stuff around it too. It'll be white colored to the eye. Um, so it surrounds an axon. So think of these things like little flattened pancakes. You know, they're not very long, but if you took a pancake, so you had a wire, the wire is your axon. And then you took a pancake and you put one edge of the pancake on the wire and then just wrapped it around the wire as many times as you could. That's basically what a Schwann cell is doing. It's just wrapped around it. Then right next to that pancake that's wrapped around the wire, there's gonna be another one wrapped around the wire. There'll be a little gap in between them. They're not gonna quite touch, you know, where the two, where the two Schwann cells are. There'll be a little node in between them. Now there could be lots and, you know, an axon can be very long. Think, think of your sciatic nerve. What if you're six feet something tall? You know, that's three feet of, an axon could be three feet long. Um, so you have lots of Schwann cells going all the way down that axon to, you know, insulate it, protect it. And um, so anyway, if I point at it, I go, what is that? You go, Schwann cell. What does it do? Myelinates in the periphery. That's all you gotta say, and you're done. Look at this guy next door, oligodendrocyte. Kind of the same job, but it's in the central nervous system, only in the brain or spinal cord. So that, it's a little different. They're not like flattened pancakes. They have little feet that, that can reach out and kind of wrap around one axon. Another foot could wrap around another. You know, it could be doing two or three or four different little segments of axons in different places. So it's not like, it's not gonna make a nice tube like these flat, like these pancake Schwann cells. You know, they're gonna make like a tunnel, right? Of individual cells. These, not so much. That's probably why, I don't know, don't, don't hold me to this. If you damage a nerve in the periphery, it can actually, those axons can grow back because the Schwann cells they think stay alive in the little tunnels, they just direct the growth. As long as the neuron's not killed, the, they, it can send another axon and they can put growth factors in and send it whoop, all the way down. Might take a long time to get your function back because look how long an axon could be. It's gonna take a long time for it to heal and grow back. Central nervous system, I don't know, a, a lot harder problem. And I think it's probably because the oligodendrocytes are not organized like that. Let's keep on scooting over. So if I back back up, if I say, what is that? Uh, what myelinates in the central nervous system? Boom, oligodendrocyte, you got the point, that's it. Astrocytes, they maintain the blood brain barrier. So let's make sure my students are still with me. You still there? Hello? Yes, I am. All right. <laughs> so the astrocytes maintain the blood brain barrier. <laughs> um, so the blood brain barrier, you know, it lets the good stuff in, keeps the bad stuff out, hopefully. 
doesn't not always perfect. Some bad things for your brain can cross. Can alcohol cross the blood brain barrier? Yes. Um, so the blood brain barrier can be very important in drug development. You could have the greatest drug for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's in the world, but if you cannot get it across the blood brain barrier, what good is it? So there's a whole bunch of research dedicated into trying to get molecules across the blood brain barrier. A lot of that's done in San Diego. All right. So I can go, what maintains the blood brain barrier? You know, multiple choice. And then obviously astrocytes. Microglia, think of them as little bitty garbage disposals. They're like little macrophages. They can crawl around and eat things up. They can also get rid of a protein black kind of deposits and stuff like that. So basically they remove waste and pathogens. So these guys are real specific, ependymal. Some people pronounce it ependymal. I don't care, just spell it right. They make CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is very, very specific. It's not like plasma. Uh, it's quite different from plasma. It's quite different from interstitial fluid. It's its own special thing. So these, I point, I go, what makes CSF? Ependymal cells, boom, you got the point. Satellites, this is the one I always had a hard time remembering ever since I learned about these. They maintain, um, they regulate, sorry, O2 and CO2 content. And they, you know, they, I guess, monitor nutrient levels and, or help with that. Um, I never could remember it. And then it re I realized, well, you know, like a satellite that's going around the earth, that's periphery. And below the earth is the atmosphere where you have O2 and CO2. And that helped me remember that uh, the satellite cells monitor the O2 and the CO2, <laughs> right? And the nutrients are all down there in the ocean. It's stupid, but that's the way I remember it. Mm -hmm. All right. So you see how I could also do a matching. I could put all six names on one side and then maintain blood brain barrier, make CSF or whatever on the right side and you'd have to match them up. So sometimes I do that. All right, and then, so that was quick, but this is everything we just talked about. Astrocytes, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, and microglia. And this is just a little artist rendition. I'm not that crazy about it, but here's a spinal cord cut horizontally across, right? And you see this little hole in the mental, middle? It's called the central canal. So it's a little hole and it's full of CSF. CSF flows down it, but it also flows around the spinal cord too. Um, so what you're looking at over here, this is what the central canal, but you've just zoomed way in. Got it? Now, I want you to look at the organization of the spinal cord. You see they drew it in brown, but that's gray matter. So this is pretty much all neurons in this butterfly shape. Outside of it, white matter. So these are columns or tracks. Remember me talking about tracks, right? So you got, this is the dorsal side. Don't worry about it. Well, I'll show you how to tone part later. And this is the ventral side. So that would be a ventral column, lateral column, dorsal column. This is an anterior median fissure because a fissure is bigger than a sulcus. A sulcus is just an invagination. All right, and so the artist did as good as they could. Um, so they're showing ependymal cells lining your central canal, and that's what's oozing this. Um, this is one of the places that CSF is being made, okay? Then if you look at the astrocyte over here, he's sealing off this capillary. So see blood is in here. This is an axon, so you see he's doing his best to maintain the blood-brain barrier, okay? And here's an oligodendrocyte. It's got one little foot myelinating this section right here, or insulating it, you got one little foot doing this. But um, you can see how it's different than a Schwann cell, but it's kind of similar, all right? Spawn cells we talked about, satellite cells we talked about. And then here's just a general picture of how Schwann cells are wrapped around an axon. So I could, I've got this laminate with no words on it. 
And if I point, I say, what cell is that? You go, Schwann cell. Am I in the periphery or am I in the central nervous system? And then you would go, periphery? Schwann cells are in the periphery. Remember from the slide a minute ago? I could point at this little gap. You go, node. I'll give you credit for node. But your book now calls them myelin sheath gaps, which is kind of kind of a mouthful. Um, almost everybody I know still calls them the old name. I guess it's the one who discovered them, nodes of Ron VA. It's a French name, so it's spelled R-A-N-V, as in Victor, I-E-R, Ron VA. Um, almost everybody calls them nodes of Ron VA. But if you say mile and sheath gap, you get the point. If you just call it node, I'm going to get you, give you the point. If I point at that, that's the axon. So this is obviously an axon that's in a nerve, and nerves are in the periphery. And these guys are full of myelin insulating. So if a nerve, if a if a uh, nerve is myelinated, the axons in it are myelinated. Is it fast? Does it send a signal faster or slower? Sends it faster, much faster than unmyelinated axons. Because, think about it, remember the little channels I was telling you about that help you send the action potential? They're concentrated in these nodes. So it's not like you have to open channels all the way down. So basically, if the say the axon hill fired, it causes these nodes, it's almost like an electric field. It causes the nodes here to have their little um, have the little channels open, and then that affects these guys. So the signal is skipping. It's almost like hopscotch. So it's jumping, 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 jumping. That's called. Don't worry about it. Saltatory conduction. You'll learn about that later. But it skips, so it's a lot faster than having to open every darn channel all the way down. That would be in a unmyelinated one. Now, just so you don't get confused when you're reading, I think you still have Schwann cells in unmyelinated axons, but they just don't have myelin in them. I think they still have the protective Schwann cells around them. All right, that's so don't get lost in the weeds here. Th this is anatomy, which is mostly point and name. I could draw a little square here and go axon hillock. I could point at the cell and you would go Schwann cell. I could point at the node, you'd go node of Ron VA. I could point at this and you go axon. So what's faster, myelinated or unmyelinated axon? What sends, sends the signal faster? You'd go myelinated. And by the way, if your axon is bigger around, some of them are bigger around than others, that sends the signal faster too. So the bigger around the axon, and if it's myelinated, that's the fastest it gets. So 300 miles an hour is about as quick as they measure them, I think, which is pretty darn fast. Don't stress on this, not gonna even put it on there since it's tele, tele lecture, but these are just different ways signals are spread out in your nervous systems. This is almost like multi-level marketing. Look, see one guy's talking to two, two's talking to three, two's talking to three, and then these guys are talking more, so it sends a signal out really fast. So think of the sympathetic nervous system. It's gonna use divergence like that. Convergence, maybe four neurons are talking to one. They're all converging on the one. And, you know, then this one has to decide, do I fire or do I not? And a good example of where you can see that is in the eye. But, you know, probably not going to even ask that on this test, but it's just good to know uh, divergence and convergence. Okay. Now, cutting some of this out too. We're not going, so when you're little, when you're a fetus, you still with me? Um, my student still with me? You there? Yes, Brandy's okay. here. <laughs> Brandy. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, when you're a fetus, you have a neural tube, right? So basically, it's going to be your brain and spinal cord. On the end, the end that's going to be your brain, it has five bulges. Originally, it's three, but we're not going to even learn those. And then those turn into five five bulges, one, two, three, four, five, and they did them in different colors. Telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, myelencephalon. So 
these all become other structures. This is just the beginning. So I could go name the five developmental regions of the brain. But the cool thing is they all end in encephalon. So in, uh, you just got to get the prefix right. Tail encephalon. So I'm going to skip back and forth between these slides. Everything in gold, and mainly it's your lobes of your brain. You know, see all those lobes? You know, your cerebral cortex, basically, and your uh, hemispheres. Um, that was all telencephalon. Look here. See this purple? You probably heard these two structures before, thalamus and hypothalamus. So that came from the diencephalon. Mesencephalon, let's just say midbrain. We're not going to even learn the structures right now at this point. But all this in green, just call it the midbrain. This is the little belly, looks like a little pregnant belly. That's the pons, see them right there? That pons came from the met encephalon. And then down here, mile encephalon. And that becomes the medulla oblongata. I always say medulla oblongata like that because of that Adam Sandler movie, Water Boy. Remember that? Where uh, they said, why is the alligator so mean? And then he goes, because he has no medulla oblongata. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but a friend of mine went to high school with Adam Sandler. Anyway. All right. So see how I could ask this? I could go, and the five developmental regions of the brain and give me one structure for meat. You go, tell encephalon. Oh, one little thing, first of all. People get these confused, but it's kind of nice. If you look, they're in alphabetical order. Mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myoencephalon. So that's the way you know which one comes when. So let's go back. Name the five developmental regions of the brain. Tell encephalon and give me a structure that comes from each. You could just say frontal lobe, occipital lobe, cerebral hemisphere. I don't care, right? Any of that. Diencephalon. And then you'd go, hmm, thalamus and hypothalamus. And the thalamus is one of your primary sensory relay stations. And we'll get to that later. Mesencephalon, just go midbrain. We can give you some specific structures later, but eh, since this is teleconference, we might not. Uh, metencephalon goes cerebellum and pons. Let's look at the cerebellum again real quick. What if this was just point name? I said, what's that structure? You go cerebellum, and I go, what does it do? And just go balance and posture. You know, a lot of signals go through there, and it's almost like an unconscious coordination of balance and posture. Um, and I could go, what developmental region did it come from? You go, oh, metencephalon. Okay. Then I point at this. I go, what structure is that? You go, myoencephalon. Uh, well, no, don't do that because that's developmental region. Although I'd probably give you credit. If I said, what structure is that? You'd go medulla oblongata. And then what developmental region did it come from? Myoencephalon. I think you're with me. All right. Just play it back over if, if it was too fast for you. All right. Here's a frontal section. So it's cut across like a coronal section. Right. And so now you can see the brain has got gray matter on the right, uh, on the outside and white matter on the inside. And then you remember me talking about nuclei? These are little islands of gray matter. And yeah, they have specific functions and names like the lentiform nucleus and the red nucleus. And all that. I don't care. I'm not going to ask you that. Um, if I just put A, 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 what are those? You go, nuclei. <laughs> are they white or gray? You go, gray. I point at this and go, what is this area? You go, cerebral cortex, white or gray? You go, gray, gray matter. So those are all neurons, basically. Now, if I point in here, so is this white or gray? You go, white matter. That's a lot of myelinated axons. Now, we got some specific, basically, tracks when you think about it. See this? See these guys flowing down here? Or, or they could be sending signals up. That's called the internal capsule. It should be in your lab book. Very important area. It's like an interstate. A lot of signals are going back and forth through here. Okay? 
So if you had a little stroke, even if it's a little one, say it's out here, yeah, it's gonna have some effect, but it's not gonna cause too, too much problem as long as it's not too big of an area. But if you had that same size blood clot or bleed or trauma or whatever in this pathway, it could cause big problems because that's where all your signals are coming through. So sometimes a stroke is not uh, how big or how big of a problem it, area it is, it's where it is. So anyway, uh, this you've probably heard of, it's just a weird view because we're looking at a frontal section. That's a corpus callosum. Some people say corpus callosum, I don't care, spell it right. You're not used to seeing it in that, and this is the anterior commissure, which I'm not gonna even probably put on this test. We took it off. Um, but it's doing the same thing. It's just sending signals back and forth to both halves of the brain. This is the way two halves of your brain communicate right here. You know, the right half with the left half. So I'm gonna scoot a couple of slides down. So you can see this is the way you're normally used to seeing the corpus callosum, right? But we were cut we were cut this away so it didn't look like that right so it's white matter and by the way it's a kind of a trick question but it's it's still called telencephalon it came <clears throat> from the telencephalon because it's connecting the two halves of the cerebral hemisphere so technically it's telencephalon where you go down here now i'm in the thalamus and around there is the hypothalamus that would be diencephalon. This area right across here is considered midbrain. So that's uh, mesencephalon, pons, cerebellum, metencephalon, and then medulla oblongata going down here. And that would be myoencephalon. So you can see as you go from top to bottom, you're going down, down that. Uh, down those structures. All right, don't worry about this blood supply. We'll talk about that when we get to another test. But you see the little arrows? That's, they're tracing um, CSF flow. You got little lateral apertures here. Don't worry about it, even if it's in your lab book. But it can flow down your, your central canal and up around, it's all around your brain. It's in these hollow areas of your brain. Got lots of CSF, okay? It's even on the outside, you know, it's just a wash in this stuff. All right, don't worry about where the blood brain barrier is found. I'm not gonna ask you where it's located and where it's not found. Just know that it's maintained by astrocytes. I could ask you that. Cranial meninges, so you've heard of some of this. You still with me, Brandy? You still there? Hello? Yes, I am. Okay, <laughs> all right. So. Protective layers of the brain and spinal cord. So you got dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater. So these are just coverings, connective tissue coverings of the brain, but they're also around the spinal cord. So the most superficial one would be dura mater. So dura mater in Latin, it means tough dura, and mater means mother. So it actually means tough mother. Arachnoid means like spider web stuff, you know, like it, technically it's arachnoid mater. I never hear it pronounced that. Everybody just calls it arachnoid. Um, so it looks kind of like spider webby under a microscope. And pia mater is shiny and it's real delicate. And that's on the bumps of the brain and down into the sulci of, you know. So these bumps, so make sure you don't miss easy stuff. Say, like, what's the general name for a bump on a brain? Well, it's a gyrus. G-Y-R-U-S. Well, I thought it was a... Uh -oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, are you still there, Brandy? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Phone rang. Um, so, um, the bumps are called gyri. Gyrus is singular, G-Y-R-U-S. And the invaginations are called sulci, or sulcus for singular. And those are, that's all covered with pia mater. This pulpy looking stuff, that's arachnoid. And then this right here, this tough stuff, dura mater. So that holds the brain in place and, you know, has a few functions. 
But here they cut into, and they're showing you the different layers, right? Now, that's another section, except for the brains are moved. I have no idea how they did this, but you can see the dura mater. So this would be going in between the two halves of the hemispheres down. And it's called, eh, bonus, I would only do this as a bonus, fault cerebri. So it's going, let me show you. That would be the fault cerebri going down in between the two halves of the brain. Partially, you know, it doesn't go that far, but it goes, you know, down in between them, kind of, kind of protects and separates. Um, and so that's called the fault cerebri. Fault means sickle, because it's shaped like a sickle, like they used to, in the old days, used to harvest hay with, you know. Um, tentorum cerebelli, I'm not gonna do on this test, but that's just dura mater that's making a tent over the cerebellum. And it's just separating and holding. You don't want your brain banging around inside of your skull when you shake your head. So this kind of holds it in place and hopefully keeps it from getting, uh, you know, like a concussion. Now, what if you did hit a tree or, you know, or a football injury, helmet or whatever, you know, hit your head really hard? Can you get boats bleeding underneath your dura or either outside of your dura? Yeah, and that would be called a subdural hematoma versus an epidural hematoma. You probably heard of that. And that can be very dangerous, you know, because it could keep bleeding and put pressure on the brain. And if you remember that uh, movie star, uh, Liam Neeson, his wife hit a tree, snow skiing up in Canada, and she didn't have on a helmet. They didn't wear helmets back then. And, you know, she hit it pretty hard. And I, I think the paramedics tried to get her to go and get an x-ray. And she was like, no, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. And she went home later that night, kept bleeding, put pressure on the brain, put pressure all the way down the brain stem. And, it, and you know, it's going to mess up your breathing centers. And she died. Uh, uh, Natasha Richardson, I think was her name. And, um, yeah, she had a hematoma of some type, and it just kept bleeding. So had they x x rayed her they could have just cut a hole not a hole that big probably but cut a little hole in the skull i think they call that a trephination and let the uh, let the pressure off and that that works quite well usually and uh then after you know she's all the pressure's gone and she's healed up then they they can put a bone graft in there or whatever and close it all back up um and they've done that for years and years and years. They've even found some ancient skulls from thousands of years ago that, that they think this was done on them. So probably they got hit in the head or fell and hit a rock or something. And they actually somehow drilled a hole in their skull and let the pressure off. And they know because it's perfectly circular almost. And then uh, it's healed back up. So I think they've known about this for a long time. All right, downhill slide here. 12 cranial nerves. I can go, how many pair of cranial nerves do you have? You go 12, right? Now, I could do a matching, but it's gonna take a little while to learn. But this, there's 12 pair. So let's get oriented here. This is the front. You're looking at the brain from underneath. So if you took one of our brain models and turned it upside down, this is what you're looking at. So these are the uh, olfactory nerves. So this is anterior and this is posterior going down your medulla oblongata and spinal cord headed that way, okay? So learn these old sayings, old owls on treetops are forever viewing green valleys and hills. It's just a stupid little mnemonic, but it gives you the first letter of each cranial nerve. So the best thing you could do well, you don't get a paper anymore, uh, but you can have, you know, scratch paper or whatever. Um, uh, when you're learning these, just go number one through 12, okay? And then out beside one, go old owls on treetops are forever viewing green valleys and hills, and hills would be number 12. And then, you know, the first letter of each, of each uh, nerve. And then, some nerves carry sensory and some carry motor in, in these nerves and some carry both kinds of signals. So if it carries sensory, 
like this olfactory. That's purely sensory. There's no motor to your olfactory, you know, receptors. Um, that's just for smell. So that's a purely sensory signal. Signal. Um, so there's a little saying to help you know which ones are sensory and motor and both. And it's kind of stupid, but write it down. It's been around for 50, 100 years. I don't know. Some say marry money, but my brother says bad boys marry money. So some say marry money, but my brother says bad boys marry money. And then do that one through 12. And then you go, oh, my olfactory must be sensory. Yes, it is. My optic must be sensory. That's carrying vision. Yes, it is. Some say. The next one is the ocular motor. Well, it's in the name. You know what that is. Motor. Some say Mary. So the M stands for motor. Trochlear. You probably remember this little guy. So on the superior oblique, muscle in the eye. Remember it went through that little sling called the trochlea? That's where I assume it gets its name because this guy goes to the superior oblique muscle of the eye. So remember the superior oblique makes you look down and out, inferior and lateral, okay? So I wouldn't do it on this test, but I've done it before on a regular test. You stimulate the trochlear nerve. Which way does your eye move? down and out, right? So uh, is that sensory motor or both? Let's see, some say marry money, so it's motor. Trigeminal, tri means three, geminal means twins, trigeminal, okay? So um, you got these on either side of your face, right? And so let's look at it. Oh, well, anyway, first, there's your olfactory bulb and track. Technically, these are your nerves, but I call the whole thing the nerve just for to make it easy. Technically, that's a that's an olfactory bulb and that's an olfactory track. But if I point at it, you can go any of that. You just go cranial nerve one, olfactory. Cranial nerve two. You can see them coming out of the back of the eyes, and then you go over this little optic chiasm, which is, chiasm means cross, and you can see some signals stay on this side of the brain and some signals cross to the other side of the brain, which is kind of unusual, but that's what it does. So if I point at that, you would go optic nerve. If I say, what's the cross? You would go optic chiasm. If I said, where are vision signals processed? You would go occipital lobes. It's kind of weird. It's all processed in the back of your brain, but your eyes are in the front. Don't ask me why. Don't know. All right. Now we go to, what was our next one? Oculomotor, number three. It's going to most of these muscles of the eye. It's not going to the superior oblique, because it's trochlea. And it's not going to this lateral rectus that we remember from last time, because that's, that's cranial nerve six. We'll get to that in a minute. But almost everything else, oculomotor, okay? So I go, what's cranial nerve three? You go, oculomotor. What, what's its function? Just go move the eye because it moves a lot of different, you know, it's a lot of different muscles. Okay, now let's go to four. See the trochlear nerve, number four. See him? It's going to the superior oblique, and that's going to move the eye down and out, like we I asked that question on the last test, remember? Um, trochlear nerve. So now let's go to five. So is that motor? Let's see. Wait, was well, trochlear motor? Some say Mary Money, yeah, motor. Trigeminal, three branches, big guy. Anytime you have a big guy, big nerve like this, it's probably both, okay? So see this branch going down your mandible? Mandibular nerve. See this branch going towards your maxilla? Maxillary branch. See this branch going towards your eye region? Ophthalmic. So you got three branches. If you ever go to the dentist and you're getting a bottom tooth numbed up, they shoot for this area here and try to flow that anesthetic here before it, before that nerve goes into that. Remember that little mandibular foramen we kept pointing out? Um, before it gets in there because you're doing a nerve block. Obviously, your tongue gets numb on that side whoop, because you see it branches off right here. 
and generally that flows and it gets that one too. And so generally your tongue will get, uh, now I'm on the same side and your jaw. Uh-oh, hopefully, my, you still there? It said my internet connection's unstable. Did it, did it cut out or are you still there? Hello? You there? Yes, we have it. Oh, okay. Did it? Yeah, okay. Hopefully it didn't cut out. Um, so we're almost done. Um, and so anyway, just three branches. So this one's sensory and motor to all, all of that. Uh, there's my abducens. It abducts the eye. So it's going to the lateral rectus, right? And so the lateral rectus makes you look laterally, which would be abducting away from the midline. Is it motor? Some say Mary, money, but my, yeah, motor. I like this one, facial. It's pretty huge. You know, it's both. Facial, number seven. I had a hard time remembering it until, you ever heard of Bell's palsy? So Bell's palsy is where the face, you know, sometimes they'll just wake up one morning and boom, it's like their face is paralyzed on one side. Um, it, they don't know why. Is it autoimmune? Is it a virus? Whatever. It usually comes back within a few months. Not always, but usually. Um, and that's called Bell's palsy, B-E-L-L, -L, right? Bell's palsy. Uh, it's pretty common, and they don't know what causes it, but it's basically the facial nerve is affected. So I never could remember seven for some reason. And then I remembered, kind of stupid, but it's the way I remember it. You know, the Rocky movies, one, two, three, four, five, and six. I always used to go, I wonder if they're ever going to make a Rocky seven. Because Rocky has Bell's palsy. But now his is from an actual damage. I think they actually damaged his facial nerve with forceps when he was being delivered. That's what I read in the National Enquirer, so it must be true. Um, but you can't really tell because, you know, they're Hollywood and they get all the surgeries and everything. So you don't really notice it. But it, I think it did affect his speech a little bit. Um, so anyway, that's Bell's palsy, which reminds me of Rocky, which reminds me of, are they going to make a Rocky 7, which they did technically with Creed. And uh, then that reminds me of facial nerve is number seven. So if that works for you, fine. <laughs> the stimulant cochlear. The stibula cochlear, that's a weird name. They used to call this the auditory nerve. They don't call it that anymore because it does more than hearing. So this cochlea, you've probably heard of that thing. looks like a snail shell. That's where a lot of your hearing, that's where your hearing, uh, you know, your little hair cells and receptors for hearing are in there. This vestibule is for balance. So it's almost like two different nerves that flow together, the stibular branch and the cochlear branch. The cochlear branch is for hearing. The vestibular branch is for balance. So this actually goes to your cerebellum, and this goes somewhere else. So it is almost like two different nerves, but they call it the vestibular cochlear nerve. Sensory motor, sensory motor, or both? Let's see. Some say Mary, money, but my brother says sensory. Yep. Number nine. This is another one I always had a hard time remembering. Glossopharyngeal. So glosso means tongue, so it's going there. Pharyngeal means pharynx, so it's going there. It's also going to your like salivary glands there. Um, I never could remember it. And then so I drew one day, I, drew, I was lecturing, and I drew the number nine on the board. And then I realized how much it looked like the letter G if I just made it, made the little, uh, made it come back up, right? And made like a, a little script G out of it. And then that makes... That reminds me of glossopharyngeal is number nine. And then I never forgot it again. Sensory motor or both? Let's see. Some say very money, but my brother says bit bad. Both. So it does both. We're almost there. Vegas. Don't spell it like Las Vegas. <laughs> right? V-A-G-U-S is the way you spell it. So it's a big one. So you know it's both. Just by look how huge it is. Goes your lungs, goes your heart, goes your gut, right? Humongous. It wanders through the, the pathway, wanders through the thoracic and abdominal cavity there. So that's where it gets a name. Uh, vagrant means wanderer in Latin. And so it's from the same word, Vegas. So it's both. 
sensory and motor, does a lot of stuff. Accessory, don't stress on it. Um, well, bonus, it's motor, right? Some say Mary Money, but my brother said bad boys, Mary, and then that's motor. So it's going to the sternocleidomastoid and it's going to the trapezius. And everybody remembers those muscles from the last test. They're pretty big. So how did it get its name? Accessory nerve. They thought it was part of the vagus. They thought it was an accessory branch off the vagus. Well, it's not. It's its own nerve. How do I remember it? And how do I remember what it does? It's kind of crazy, but there's a theory that the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscles are part of your muscles of mastication for eating food. Um, you go, wait, those don't move the jaw. No, they don't. But if you ever watch a German shepherd get a hold of a steak, and uh, say another German shepherd's got a hold of the other side of that steak, they start shaking their heads back and forth very violently. And it's kind of technically they're tearing into that food or say it's a deer carcass or something. So it could be accessory muscles of mastication. Who knows if they are or not, but that's the way I remember them because you use your sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius to shake your head back and forth. And so if you had a big old elk hide, the only way you could possibly break through it would be to grab that skin with your hands, bite into it, and then shake your head back and forth if there were no knives or forks or fire, if you were a caveman or woman. All right. Last one here. This would be hypoglossal nerve below the tongue. So just know it's motor. Okay, then we're good. So let's back up, make sure you know them real quick. Boop. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibular cochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, and then high, uh, accessory. Notice the way they're out of order there, and hypoglossal. So be careful. When you have this lamina, you can basically count. You can go one. Two, three, four, be careful on five, number five, number six, be careful on seven, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, 11, looks like an 11, <laughs> right? And then you have to go back up here to 12. So if you get lost, look at that laminate, right? And say, say I went A, say I went B. Say so I went C and D. You go A. Oh, that's number one, olfactory. Two, three, oh, that's oculomotor. And then I went, well, I forget which ones I did. Uh, I think I did 10, which would be vagus, and 11 would be accessory. So you can do numbers. Just don't mess up. Don't call that a nerve. That's the infundibulum. The infundibulum hangs the pituitary down. Uh, into the cella tersica, remember on the sphenoid bone on our bone test? So that's not a nerve, plus they don't have it in yellow. They drew all the nerves in yellow here. So that'll totally mess you up. If you went one, two, three, you're totally wrong from then on. So you go one, two, three, right? Four, five, they're on both sides, right? So don't mess up, just be sure that you go back up here to 12. One more structure that I can do. See these two bumps? Called the mammillary bodies. Don't say mammary, mammillary, which it's kind of related to that. Some researcher or anatomist hundreds and hundreds of years ago looked at this and says, that looks like cleavage. They thought it looked like breast. So that's how it got the name, mammillary. Don't say mammary, mammillary bodies. Total fluke from what I understand. They, they had no idea what they did. They just named them, right? And years and years and years later, when they were figuring out what different parts of the brain did, they found out that this, look it up, make sure I'm not lying to you, but I'm pretty sure, controls the suckling reflex on infants. <laughs> so it was a total coincidence that they look like breasts and it controls the suckling reflex on the infants. Kind of crazy. Um, all right, so there's all of those. Dang, look how quick we're going. All right, um, on a cut, nah, great, nope. 
almost finished. So be careful here. Point it's like, what's a bump? A gyrus. What's a invagination? A sulcus. What's this big fissure that's long and going down the middle? Longitudinal fissure. Now, I probably wouldn't do it on this model, but this sulcus is very important. Central sulcus. Okay. So the central sulcus is, let's look here. Now you can see it. They got red and blue. The central sulcus, it's like a dividing line. So here's the front of the brain and there's the back. Okay. This in red is your motor cortex. I mean, your frontal lobe does way more than motor, but think motor when you think frontal lobe. It does thinking and all kind of stuff, right? This blue, your parietal lobe, that's your uh, sensory. That's for general sensory. That's your parietal lobe. Big division here. Everything in front, so if I stuck an electric probe in here and stimulated, it's going to stimulate sensory neurons. I mean, sorry, uh, motor neurons. So somewhere, say it's for your finger, your finger might would jump because that's where those signals come from. So when you want to move your hand, it's coming from pre-central gyrus somewhere. Now, you scratch your finger with your thumbnail, that signal lands somewhere post-central gyrus, somewhere on this parietal lobe. So that's just where your general sensory is processed. Your motor is processed in front of the central sulcus, and it sends a signal efferent. And behind the central sulcus is where your sensory lands. Okay, so that's afferent signals are coming there. Okay, occipital lobe, that's where your vision is processed, right? Temporal lobe, um, notice the way it says auditory cortex, but there's also uh, some smell right here. Uh, all on this temporal lobe, the way I remember that. Telephone, which reminds me of hearing, starts with a T, which reminds me of temporal lobe. Smell also goes to the temporal lobe, which is kind of weird, but then they were trying to make cell phones that they were gonna call smellophones, that you could actually, like on Valentine's Day, you could send a smell from your phone to the other. Basically, there were little, I don't know, little things in your phone that could emit a smell. And then if somebody sent a signal to it, you would be able to smell like a flower on Valentine's Day or whatever. So that reminds me, telephone, smell a phone. And then that reminds me of temporal lobe because you know the T goes with the telephone and T goes with temporal lobe. So temporal lobe is for hearing and smell. Stupid, just the way I remember it. Okay, when you have a cut like this, here's a cerebellum. See the little white tree? What about my student? Can you see the little white tree? Brandy? Yes, I can. You awake? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> All right, so here's your arbor vitae or vitae. That's just white matter in your cerebellum. Okay, it means tree of life. So it's probably from the Bible, right? These things are named like thousand, two thousand years ago in Latin. So if you forget in English, arbor vitae, I mean, you forget um, arbor vitae, but you give me what it means in Latin, tree of life, you'll still get a half a point. Here's your corpus callosum. Whoops, sorry. Here's your corpus callosum, right? Here's thalamus, right? So that's one of your mammillary bodies, but you're cut, you don't see the other one. There's your pons, there's your medulla. What is this? Well, that's a ventricle. I kind of skipped over ventricles. We're going to back up for a second. So ventricles are hollow areas in the brain. And CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is in our, those areas. And sometimes it's produced in those areas. So let's back up and show you what ventricles look like. I skipped them on purpose. So I can show you that. All right. Where's my ventricles? There. So here's a frontal section, and here you're looking from the side. Kind of looks like, uh-oh, my internet connection is unstable. I hope I don't cut out. If I do, call me. 
Oh, it came back. I think I'm okay. Am I still okay? You're okay. Okay, we're almost done. So these are ventricles. So you got lateral ventricles on the sides. You have a third ventricle and you have a fourth ventricle. So technically these are one and two. I have no idea if the one on the left is one or if the one on the right is number one. I've never found it in any anatomy book. If you find it and you email it to me and it's legit, you get a point. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't know which one's one and which one's two. So they're um, lateral ventricles. So they kind of look like ram's horns. You see the ram's horns? Right? There's little connections here. And this guy looks like a bird. See, the eye is actually white matter. So these, the blue is hollow areas. Okay, and the beak of the bird, around the beak of the bird is your hypothalamus. On either side of the head of this bird, that's your thalamus. So your thalamus has got this hollow area inside of it full of, full of CSF. So the thalamus technically is out here and out here. Okay, and think of the thalamus as a, as a relay station. I think of it as air traffic control. Almost everything sensory goes through the thalamus, almost, not quite, okay? To go to wherever in the heck it's going in the brain. Here's your fourth ventricle, and it's connected by an aqueduct. See the aqueduct? Remember the Roman aqueducts carried water? Well, this kind of does too. They call it the aqueduct of the midbrain or the aqueduct of Sylvius, S-Y-L-V-I-U-S, or just cerebral aqueduct. If you just call it aqueduct, I'll probably give it to you. Uh, but aqueductus sylvius is what everyone calls it. So let's go back to here. Where are we at? There. There's my fourth ventricle. The third is the bird. Remember the bird? It looked like a bird. The third is a bird. And then here's the aqueduct coming down here. This is a really good section. I don't know how they got it so perfect, but it's a perfect section and they sliced right down the aqueduct. There's a pineal gland, by the way. I'm probably not gonna point at it, but that kind of helps regulate your, you know, your diurnal cycle, sleep, wake, spring, summer, winter, fall, all that kind of stuff, supposedly. I'm not gonna get into all that. So I point at that, go fourth ventricle. What is that little? opening and you go aqueduct of sylvius so or i could just ask a question what tube connects the third and the fourth ventricles and you go aqueduct of the midbrain or sylvius there's a pituitary hanging down i'm not gonna get into that hanging down off the hypothalamus by the way so yeah it's hollow that's the third ventricle now one thing i skipped over in parts of these ventricles is this stuff called a choroid plexus. I'll back back up. So it's making CSF. All right, so let's back back up real quick. That choroid plexus. So it's ependymal cells and capillaries. So it's all mixed in together. The capillaries have to bring in fluid and then the ependymal cells process it and make CSF. And it's found, like I said, you know, in a lot of different places, you know, up and down that central canal. It's found in some of your uh, places in your ventricles. But it, choroid plexus, produces 500 milliliters a day. That's about like one of your little water bottles. So it flows, and once it's done its thing, and it's got a lot of waste product, it has to go back into the general circulation. And then you make more. If you get stopped up, can you increase your intracranial pressure? Yeah, big problem. So that can be a problem. Um, so see the pink? That's your choroid plexus. I thought choroid meant pink. I thought I knew my Latin. I didn't. It actually means afterbirth, <laughs> at least according to Wikipedia, which is kind of pink. So I wasn't totally off base, but you know, they name these things by the way they look, but it's full of capillaries, which are kind of reddish pink, and then the ependymal cells. So, it, you know, they named it choroid, which according to Wikipedia means afterbirth. 
that makes your CSF. Once your CFF is, CSF is done, it's got to go back into the venous blood. Remember your superior sagittal sinus right there? These little arachnoid granulations. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you arachnoid granulations or arachnoid villi. That's just what they're called. That's putting fluid back into your blood, and then it can go get cleaned out by your liver or whatever. So CSF just can't stay in the brain. It's got to circulate. And so it's constantly flowing into this lower pressure blood, and then it's constantly being made by the choroid. And I think we're good. Almost done. I think we are done, basically. Um, back view of the uh, cerebellum. Point name, this looks like an earthworm just that connects the two halves of the vermis. It's called the, ver the I mean, two halves of the cerebellum. It's called the vermis, which means worm. There's your arbor vitae, tree of life. There's a good arbor vitae. There's a good medulla oblongata. There's a good pons, good corpus callosum. Corpus callosum connects your left and your half, right half of your brain. And then this is just showing you, this is frontal lobe because they did it in red for motor. And this is cut a little behind it in a frontal section into your parietal. And they're showing you what sensory stuff is being processed there. That just shows where your hand you know, the parts that control your hand or feel from your hand and face are located. And you notice a lot of your brain's dedicated to face and hands because that's where most of our receptors are. And that's it. One last little clinical thing. If you cut that corpus callosum in half, for you psychology guys, can you get what they call split brain syndrome, basically? Yeah. Um, so sometimes for epilepsy, they actually have to go in there and cut it. It's, it's rare, but sometimes they do. And then, you know, the way your left half and your right half of your brain control different things, uh, different, different functions, it's almost like you're two different people. <laughs> and they showed this woman on TV that they had done this to, but it, it, it caused her seizures to stop. So that was good. But then it's almost like she was two people. It was showing her she was getting ready to go out for the night. And she, she opens her closet and she's reaching in for the red dress with her right hand. And then you see her left hand come up and it slaps her right hand out of the way and grabs the blue dress. So it's almost like two people are fighting over which dress they wanted to wear. It's very strange. Anyway, that should do it. So that should be the end of this lecture. And you're still with us, Brandy? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to, hold on, I'm going to try to close out of here. Okay, the screen's gone now, I hope. Yes. Okay, and then end meeting. End meeting for all. Okay, and then I'll, I'll give you a